Why can we not simply read translations of classical Latin Greek works in English? I would describe them as having different glories. The glory is not in what they said, but in how they said it. When you read a translation, you're disregarding every word choice that he made. How's English doing? You're trying to get me to defend my position that English is in decline. That probably killed Latin. Uh, when we talk about who killed Latin and it was the Ciceronians, his name was... Today we get to talk with Tim Griffith, who is a senior fellow of classical languages at New St. Andrews College. He's also the chairman for the Institute of Classical Languages and the director of the Universal Latin Exam. And he spent the last two decades developing methods of ancient language teaching, most notably the famous Picta Dicta online learning platform designed to buttress immersion for ancient language pedagogy in a novel and pretty interactive way. So, Tim, thanks so much for being here today. How are you? I'm well. Thank you for having me. I'm so I'm just so so glad to talk with you because I as got this question why can we not simply read translations of classical Latin Greek works in English or whatever modern language? Right, it's a good question, and I think the answer is it depends on what you're reading. And um, so, different authors, uh, I would I would describe them as having different glories. Some have a glory in the story that they're telling. Some authors have a glory in the ideas that they're articulating. And these are the sorts of authors that you can actually um, read in translation and really get to enjoy a lot of that glory because it translates well. And so uh, if you're reading uh, Plato's philosophy, um, reading it in translation, you're going to be able to access the the ideas that he's that he's got no pun intended but the um and if you're going to be reading something like homer i would say that uh you actually there's there's a phenomenal plot um and a lot of ideas there that as you're reading through them you really can enjoy it very well in english um but i would say other authors, it's actually their glory is not in what they said, but in how they said it. And so this is particularly when you get to uh, a lot of poets who are, they, they manage to say something and put it in words in such a way where it finally makes sense um, and it kind of gives, um, gives us all a way of understanding something that we kind of knew was true or we were just on the cusp of understanding it. And the way it was said makes it clear to us. And that sort of, when you have an author who has that kind of glory um, in their writing, that is what doesn't translate well. And uh, because when you change the words that they're actually using and the structures that they're using for communicating their thought, you've changed how you've expressed it. So um, in general, I would say that the, the poets, uh, the great poets, are great poets, not necessarily because of what they said, but because of how they said it. Now, that's not always, it's not always as cut and dry as that, but that's a, I think that's a general rule of thumb. So I, you know, looking at someone like Virgil, I would claim that Virgil's glory is in his way of telling his story and, and in the imagery, um, the way that when you're actually reading his work, you can see it unfolding. I actually think Virgil was the closest thing to movies before movies. Um, mm. As you are reading uh, him, and uh, and listening to his words, the pictures unfold in a very particular way. And it's uh, once you translate it into English, the you can't actually express those things in the same way. So uh, keep in mind, someone like Virgil spent 10 years actually uh, writing the Aeneid. He's... He's spending, um, I think he was writing something like eight 
eight lines of dactylic hexameter per day. He's he's um, he is uh, uh, pouring over his work and and spending all this time choosing each word. When you read a translation, you're disregarding every word choice that he made. So my question is, can you even say that you've read Virgil? Na, ni simbultorum brae captis, multisque literis mihi abadolescentia sua sisse, nihil esien vita man opere expedendum, ni si laude, atque honestate. Eneo altem persequendo omnes cruciatus corporis, omnia pericula mortis, atque exili parvi esse ducenda. Nunquam me pro salute vestra in totac tantas dimicationes, at quin hos profligator hominum quotidianos impetus objecisse. These are the words of Cicero, the great Roman statesman and orator. What made Cicero willing to face down the threat of torture, exile, and death? Here's what he says. Set pleni sunt omnes libri, plenae sapientium voces, plen exemplorum vetustas, quae jacerent in tenebris omnia. Nisi literarum lumen accederet. Lumen literarum, the light of literature. This, Cicero says, is what guided him and so many others in performing noble deeds, undertaking grand adventures, and achieving great conquests. Cicero continues, Quam multas nobis imagines non solo ad intuendum, vero etio ad imitandum fortissimor virorum expressas scriptores et graeci et latini reliquerunt. In the literature of the Greeks and Romans, we encounter images of greatness. For contemplating, yes, but also for imitating. The Ancient Language Institute exists to help people encounter these ancient images of greatness in the very words of the great writers of the past. I think a helpful way to think of it is, um, to, is to compare it to one of our own greats. I like to look at someone like Tolkien. So Tolkien, Tolkien has a lot of glories. Okay, He's got glory in the plot. But he's also got glory in just the way he tells a story, and it's so it's so English, um, and there's this richness to it, and that's the reason why we like it so much. Now, if you imagine someone reading it in translation, in, in say into Spanish, um, so they read they read um, El Hobito in Spanish, would it be fair to say that they've read the hobbit i would say yeah they've read the hobbit you know there's a bilbo there's a smog and you know they're the dwarves and you go through all that um and that's still and it's a good story but would it be fair to say that that they've read tolkien um and i would say no um the tolkienness of it would be gone now it could still be worth reading but it wouldn't be there so um, kind of circle back to your question, why do we need to read things in the original? I'd say it depends on what they are. Um, some of the best things ever said were said in different languages and in such a way that you can't really interact with them. Um, you can't really um, experience that charisma of the original author unless you're actually reading the language that he wrote or she wrote. And um, the uh, we see that a lot of times where great authors that wrote amazing works have kind of fallen into um, obscurity because no one wants to read them anymore in translation. And oftentimes you can see that where a, a particular author's work just doesn't really work in our language. Um, mm. I would bring up Horace as an example of this. Um, Horace was extremely popular um, up until fairly recently, and and nobody really reads Horace in translation. At least I don't. Not that I know of. Um, I never and, have myself. I always read them in, in the original. Right, but, uh, and in the original, he's outstanding, of course. Um, 
Yeah, the the only uh, translation of Horace that I've ever read that that really seemed to even make sense was um, was actually from Milton. And of course, because Milton wrote it, the translator was as great as the as the one who wrote it in the first place. And so, you know, you can have things like that. But um, in general, I would say, what are you actually uh, reading? If you're reading something that's dry and dusty, um, but had important ideas, I think reading an English uh, translation is completely fine. But if you're reading something that is actually one of the greats and it has this glory in the way that the story was told um, and that the idea was formed, well, then you, you're going to have to learn the, uh, the original language in order to be able to experience that. Wow. Yeah, I really resonate when you said that about, about Virgil, like original movies. When I was reciting the second book of the Aeneid for Ancient Language Institute, I am fam familiar with it. I never read it all at once before. I'm so comfortable reading hexameter, though, and reading Latin that I knew I, I didn't have to prepare. I could read it like like English, like, I don't know, some some epic poem in, in English and, and just just be you know moved by it that way but i wasn't expecting to be so thrilled even though i knew what was going to happen but the phrasing and how it moved and one scene to the next and the you know the the images of, of venus of, you know all, all of it and, and creusa all of it just um was startling and amazing and so i i was i i fully resonate with that i think i might have seen when i was a kid some translation of of the India, not didn't read much of it, but it, you know, it was as good as it as it could be, but it doesn't doesn't move me like like that does. Yeah. yeah. So go ahead. One one uh, anecdote about that. Um so uh years ago I was reading through the Aeneid um and I was I was using the Loeb classical edition and I'm reading in bed before I go to sleep uh, beside my wife and I'm 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 reading I think I was in book three um and there was this moment where i just felt like i got sucked out of my room and i was watching all of these sailors um uh, prepare their boat um uh and you know waiting for the uh the wind to be right and all of this and and i just i just felt like i was sucked in and i was watching it all happening and i i just said oh Hey babe, you got to hear this. Um, hold on, and I just flipped over to the English side, and I started reading it out. And after a couple lines, I was, I, I was just, uh, never mind. Um, <laughs> it, it sounded like a transition passage um, because plot wise, that's what it was. It was simply just moving people from A to B in order to advance the plot. At least that's mm. what it sounded like. But the way in which he actually told that. Um, it was it was putting you in uh, there where you could watch it all happening. Um, but anyway, that's uh, poetry is what's lost in translation, and, and that's yeah. that's what happens with that kind of work. Oh, you're right about that. I remember having that same experience reading something. I don't remember what it was. It's happened on more than one occasion. Something in Latin or something in ancient Greek, and wanting to to share with my my fiance, and then trying to translate it spontaneously. And it's just well, you know, I, I'm not that not necessarily that good at that anyway. I'm not a, a trained translator at all uh, in any language. Anyway, I remember just being like, "Ah, oh, I'm going to stop wasting your time." Just very sweet, honey. Thank you for listening to, to my big excitement. She was she was of course um, very sweet. <laughs> about it but i realized yeah it's it it's uh it it's that is something really important and powerful and for those who haven't been moved by poetry before in their lives uh i hope they get to have it in latin because i absolutely love ancient greek poetry but i am a strong proponent that latin poetry is is yet superior to the ancient greek poetry for all its amazing variety and i have some reasons i feel that way um, that's that's mostly about the music that's inherent in it, and you know I feel that way the, about uh, the fact that like if you take the content of a song, when you take a, any of the Beatles songs that most people really like, and but if you just extract the content of it and you have a literal translation, it's like oh well that's nice, but then but the 
but you there there are dimensions to a, a piece of artwork like that and if melody the the music the musical notes are part of it is you know just just saying the the, the words it's been a it's been a hard day's night and so forth or yesterday or all of those and it just it comes out so bland and it's because it wasn't meant to be a simple you know a spoken word poem and then a spoken word poem dissolved of its uh, meter and the other choices the word choices put into you know simple english or something that could uh that can lead to be, you understand it you but it, you you did it because the the understanding the true understanding that is not just that superficial level of of um basic meanings of words and you have a really interesting opinion that i wanted to explore about the simplicity or complexity of english depending on the era depending on the writer or the speaker um How's English doing? You think <laughs> you're trying to get me to to defend my position that English is in decline? <laughs> yeah, you said, yeah, you said yeah. English is in decline, and and I'm yeah. Uh, I, I want yeah how and why, and I want to explore that. Sure. Um, so uh, the the way that I would view it is um, if if you look at um, English, English comes of course from Uh, Old English is a is an Anglo-Saxon a Germanic language that itself um, was quite simple and incapable of actually expressing many of the ideas that English now expresses. Um, and beginning with a number of transformations, English grew and stepped it up a notch one after another. Um, so the first one probably being uh, Alfred the Great, um, as his project is trying to um, be able to communicate uh, ideas and philosophy and theology and the scriptures and, and, uh, and things like that in um, Old English for the first time. And when you do that, the language actually grows. Where does it grow from? It grows from the source uh, that you're you're uh, looking at. And in this case, it was it was Latin, and so many works are being translated from um, Latin into English um, at this time, and um, as a result, English becomes a more robust language. It happens again. Um, after the Norman invasion and the influx of uh, um, French into um, English, and as the languages mix, it becomes actually a, a, a more capable language, a broader vocabulary. It, they're introduced to more kinds of literature and all that. And then again, uh, with um, really in the 16th century, as um, as uh, everyone's getting away from using Latin as being this uh, lingua franca and, and everyone's trying to put things in the vernacular, um, English again takes this huge step up um, uh, where, where people are writing all sorts of works in um, English and they are adding vocabulary and all that um, from Latin and in some cases Greek. So, It, it gets even uh, more interesting when um, uh, Queen Elizabeth's tutor, uh, Roger Ascom, made a decree um, that in English schools, they were to stop speaking Latin um, because they might get it wrong and they might mess things up. Um, but what he wanted was them to adopt a strict exercise of translation from English Uh, from Latin into English, so they'd translate some Cicero into, um, uh, or Caesar into English. They would remove the original, and then they would see if they could translate it back into the original as closely as possible. It was very objective, and there wasn't any of this messy people using Latin in the holes or anything like that. And um, that was um, his method. Now, that probably killed um, Latin. Uh, when we talk about who killed Latin, and it was the Ciceronians, his name was Roger Ascom, that's who it was. Um, 
And it wasn't good for the Latin. But what's interesting is during that time, for hundreds of years after that, starting in England and, and going into the States and other, other places, um, schoolboys were spending so much of their time, uh, years and years of their, of, of their time, translating from Latin to English and then English to Latin. And what that did was it meant that a lot of that Latinate structure actually found its way into the minds of the elites who were speaking English. And as a result, um, if you actually look and read the English of um, the uh, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, um, if you know Latin well, you can see very, very clearly how Latinate it is. The structure is, um, is clearly like that. Now, once Latin is removed from the curriculum, what's interesting is that structure, that complexity that was kind of built on, um, on Latin um, has absolutely been fading. And although you see um, very complex versions of modern English, and I'm, I'm not trying to to say that that is uh, that doesn't exist, it does, um, but it's not very popular. And so, a, a great way to to look at that is just to look at the common look at the kind of language um, that we see in documents from the 19th century, which, because of Google Books, are very available to us. You can read these things, um, and these were things that common people were reading. And structurally, syntactically, they're they're far more complex and far more uh, varied. So I would argue that um, over the last hundred years, as we've removed um, uh, our um, the root languages uh, from the study of the curriculum, that English has kind of been sliding um, into its default. And you can see that, um, you can really see that in the fact that we have to go and study works that were written just a few decades ago in school simply to understand what they're meaning. Um, anyway, I, that that's basically mm. a summary of their argument. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very interesting argument because I've been aware of that too. Reading, I like reading uh, Civil War letters or maybe just even the Gettysburg Address, really stuff that people are acquainted with. Uh, or could easily be acquainted with from the 19th century that reveals greater amount of periods and parentheses and these sorts of things. And um, although I I resonate with your argument and some part of me feels that might be true, I wonder also if it's sampling error and also people speak of uh, almost every generation back to uh, Cato, you know, is talking about that uh, kids these days are so, you know, they're ill-behaved and they're they're dumb and they're getting dumber and all those things. And I wonder if, uh, if it's if it's r really the case because it, if, if um, maybe because since almost every single person that we encounter now has access to to the of course the internet so why don't they just go read so you know so that that would be great read that on their on their iphones or their samsung devices or whatever instead of course what it really means is now their um their use of language in this case let's say english their use of language whatever that is is going into the um um it was uh mccorder said fingered speech so text messages fingered speech so essentially how they speak is going into the you know this writing and then you they associate text message and other similar writing with that's not really writing it's really a form of more casual speech oh that's what writing is and that that could possibly have an effect that brings things down for them but i wonder if it's also because now that's um there's just so many more people who are putting their ways of, of phrasing things into the internet that people are now have this perception that that people write are writing worse and worse and worse. I don't. I don't know. I, I haven't looked at any of these statistics. I'm not sure if you have. 
Right. I think it, it's, um, it'd be hard to prove, but I, okay. On the sampling error, that's one comparing literate people to literate people. Mm. And so if you're, if you're looking at the 19th century, um, and again, there's just so much material that you see on, on, uh, uh, Google books, um, where, uh, there, there's a lot of this stuff that's available. So you can see this and, um, these people are literate people. That's true. Um, but we also know that regular people were reading these works. And so people were reading things like Homer in translation. People, uh, farmers were reading Cato. You mentioned Cato. Cato yeah. They were reading Cato in translation, all that. Um, and um, so I, I think we probably have enough data where someone could actually know for sure. Um, but I am, uh, you, you asked for my opinion and that's what I think, um, from my observations, but I'd say, um, yeah, there's, it would be really interesting to actually, um, do the work to, uh, figure out exactly, um, how much loss of complexity there is. But one, one thing is very clear is that, um, is that, um more and more we have to teach if you want to get people to read literature um you have to teach them in school um and so uh even even something like you know just a few decades ago seems difficult the lord of the rings seems difficult to many many people mm. um, and that of course was is, is not far off if you go back a little further it gets even more difficult um, because the the vocabulary and the and the the structure and and um, the complexity um, of the way they're telling the story. So, yeah, it certainly seems to be the case. Um, that's my suspicion. But right. would it hold it up to academic scrutiny? I don't know. I, I, I believe know. it would, but the uh, time will tell. Yeah, and I remember. Will. Yeah, the first time I read. Um, Jane Austen, like Pride and Prejudice, just thinking, wow, I love how long these sentences are. I follow it very easily, but it, it reminded me of a lot. And I remember thinking that too. If I was, if you mentioned robust. I thought that was really interesting. What makes a language robust? I'd say it's uh, the ability to say things in more than one way. Um, Is so, that just vocabulary or also syntax? No, both. It definitely would be both. So your syntax um really think of it as they're different vehicles for expressing ideas and then your vocabulary um you've got you know your different ideas um uh it, wrapped up in vocabulary and so when you combine those two um i think that is what makes a language um robust of the way i'm using it so Erasmus is de copia verborum um, uh, would be a great example of this, where you take something like Latin, uh, if you're if you're Erasmus, and you can take a sentence and rewrite it 300 different ways, and that's what he does over and over again in that work. Um, and when I first heard of that, I thought, well, okay, the first three are going to be good, and the other <laughs> 297 are going to be garbage technically okay and that's not the case at all um and um now english is um became a uh, hugely robust language um through its influence um with uh of classical and old languages other la foreign languages too um but um languages don't always grow and i think that um you can see a clear uh, growth of a language or a decline of a language. And it all depends on what people are reading and what their inputs are. I mean, it makes sense. Um, and so if, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm an old guy with students. So of course I'm complaining like Cato about, you know, kids these days can't form a sentence. And perhaps that's just because I'm an old guy who likes to complain about students, but um if you had lived um, in 
you know, the day of days of Chaucer or in the 16th century, that wouldn't have been the case. Um, so um, Shakespeare is coining words like crazy and his peers are too. Um, they're actually really um, stretching the language, not shrinking it. Um, and, um, and they're not neglecting the, the older portions of the language either. So, yeah. Hmm. I was thinking of Politics in the English Language by George Orwell. In Politics in the English Language, he decries the usage of obscure language, especially in newspapers, but also in, in authors, where it's not really descriptive so much as it's they're using terms to sound smart right. or, you know, using Latinate words. He, he goes out of his way, as I recall, to critique those. Instead of using those, use a good old fashioned Anglo Saxon word, you know, something that, um, you know, uh, instead of, um, I don't know, impale. You say, oh, this, the, that uh, the soldier with a sword, he he ran him through. And, you know, some, maybe I'm, I'm just coming up with that on the top of my head. Sure, he right. also talks about, he says how the it's a not untoward uh, behavior or something. And then he he lampoons that by saying a not unbrown dog was running on a not ungreen field and a not unsunny day. And then so with this, this kind of thing. So, yeah, which is interesting because he was sort of he wasn't saying don't use words of latin and, and greek origin but he was saying that to favor words that have a more visceral impact on the reader because they're part of a, a core english vocabulary and also right. for syntax too right yeah no it's a well um the way i would explain that is to back up a little bit um so the latinate words that he's criticizing um absolutely have this visceral effect as well if you actually understand them um the problem is the problem of dead metaphors and so um words are built on metaphors and over time we forget what those metaphors were or how they worked and then they just become simple symbols and so um a um an example of this for me um, is uh, the word pipsqueak, which I always thought was funny, right? It has a funny sound, um, but I never realized what it really meant until I finally figured out what a pip was. Uh, it's an orange seed or a, or a lemon seed. And I was messing around when I was eating an orange once and I squeezed a... Um, an orange seed, and it made the most insignificant little squeak that I have ever heard in my life. It was the tiniest little thing. And um, and I realized what a devastating insult that was to call oh. some pip squeak, if that's really where it came from, which um, I'm just assuming. But the thing is, that was a great insult at the time if you knew what a pip was and if, and if you knew that it squeaked, right? But then it just becomes a pip squeak is just a funny thing to call someone and we don't really know what it is. Um, and say when it comes to Latinate words, um, uh, if you actually know Latin, these words carry all that meaning. Um, but for an audience that doesn't, they do sound like you're being pretentious. So insipidus literally means tasteless. Yeah. And insipid, right? Insipid just sounds like a fancy word to us if we don't actually know that. But if you do, then it's meaningful. And so um, I think that um, if we if we go back a few hundred years, um, some people who were using Latin, uh, Latinate words in English well, and it was widely understood. Um, but once the study of Latin declines, those words stop having meaning and uh, or strength, even though you might know, generally, you might be able to give a definition of what insipid means, you lose the color and the power and the punch. And so people like Orwell are saying, oh, well, the solution to this 
is to just stop using them entirely and just abandon them. And that's the opposite of what um, actually created the English language as we know it today. It was a wave after wave of people using new words and discovering new meanings. So I guess it all depends on where you are. If you want to, to be on the, uh, the up and up with a language, you need to not be doing what Orwell is recommending. But if you're just okay with being in decline, well then yes. Um, now, from a rhetorical point of view, there's nothing more obnoxious um, uh, than using words that your audience doesn't understand. Um, and, and so um, uh, being obnoxious is bad. Uh, I, I don't know. That's not always bad. Sometimes you just need to be obnoxious. But the um, yeah, Socrates was obnoxious, although. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In a pretentious sort of way. Um, you know, I, I see his point, but ultimately um, it's a result of us choosing to forget our past. Um, mm -hmm. And so much of our past is actually bound up in the language um, that that we uh, speak so, mm. or that that's we spoke. Yeah, well, that's, that's a really, really interesting about that. And I think too, um, that. George Orwell's opinion can probably work well with what you're advocating, especially because a lot of the people he was critiquing were not thinking about the meaning of the word in Latin or Greek or wherever it came from, and were just using it because it was filling this kind of vacuous, this insipid or uh, vapid ether of, of just clouds of words and just trying, and for the purpose of uh, obscuring, like political language for obscuring rather than clarifying and, and describing. Okay, so we learn Latin. Well, we learn Latin to understand great authors like Jane Austen, Shakespeare, Tolkien, better. Okay, so we, we could, but why not just read more great English classical literature? Is that not enough to instill in, in ourselves the habits, abilities, and modes of expression? So I think that um, you're not going to get me to argue that we shouldn't read more of the English classics. Um, I think that uh, we actually should be reading lots of them. Um, and, and I would argue that um, we, if we taught well, and efficiently, we would have a lot more room um, to uh, read more and more of these sorts of classics. And um, I actually think that reading uh, Jane Austen and Tolkien can, can actually be a doorway into getting into the older stuff. So it's not like you have to learn the ancient language first before you can really appreciate Tolkien. I think you move uh, moving backwards um, is a is is what you should do. Um, by reading enough Tolkien, you're going to have the thought patterns that reflect a lot of ancient um, uh, thought in um, in his work. To go back a little further, and to mm -hmm. read some of those things, and go back a little further. And I also think that listening to them, um, listening to recordings of them is even more effective. And so when you hear someone using particular sentence structures and particular vocabulary, you are a lot more likely to internalize that as opposed to just letting your eyeball fly across a page and maybe not even reading every word. And so um, I would say, um, can't we have both? Um, so we start with a robust, uh, I think, a robust um, education in the English classics that are closest to us. And then we start moving backwards. And for those of us who have the leisure to do so, um, that's going to mean studying ancient languages um, at some point. Hmm. Hmm. So interesting. Also, too, when it comes to, okay, so if we know Latin, we can appreciate the meaning of, say, words like insipid or vapid and everything, because we know exactly what they mean in Latin. 
especially if you use Latin actively, which we'll talk about presently. But can we not just study the etymology of vocabulary words and learn them that way? Is that comparably effective? Is that more I don't efficient? Think, or I, I, one, I don't think it would be more efficient. Um, but um, I think that would just give you head knowledge anyway. If you were, if our goal was to get that kind of visceral um, meaning that a word has to have connotation, which means it has to be used in real situations. Reading about a word is not the same thing as reading a word in context. And so when you've, um, when you've been reading uh, older literature and you've seen these words used um, you know, for real in the jungle, you've seen them used there, it gives you this appreciation um, for what they are. So, you know, someone who's actually uh, been in India and seen a tiger in the wild, okay, is going to have a very different experience from someone who's seen one um, uh, on a YouTube video. Mm. And and so maybe that's a good comparison where um, you might learn about something, but if you've actually um, seen it in context and experienced it in context, that's what's going to give you that visceral um, uh, uh, effect that um, that he was uh, that he was after apparently. Hmm. That's interesting. I was suddenly reminded when you said a visceral experience that you have on your own of how I I used to fly uh, helicopters in the army. I'm a private pilot. So I've had the experience of being at the front of an aircraft and having my, my own life, of course, in my own hands and other people's if I had passengers. And that what that has done for me is the numerous um, cross-Atlantic flights that, I, that I've had to take over the years. I, when there's turbulence, for example, and I've been there and it's uncomfortable. It's if you're uncomfortable in the back, the pilot is way more uncomfortable because he's working uh, his uh, rear end off trying to make sure because he's not enjoy wouldn't enjoy the turbulence any more than you. And he's trying to do everything he can to, to make it make it comfortable. And also on landings, if it's, you know, really windy or, you know, and you, you do something, um, you know, coming in at an angle. And if you look out the window, you notice like, we're going in at an angle. Is this okay? And you, you freaked out and you think and you might even uh, think the pilot isn't even doing a good job. But having had the experience of doing all those things and knowing how, how to deal with a crosswind and when it's sometimes too, I've even been uh, recently, I think we had to do a go around, which is where it's the conditions aren't right for landing. So you have to go around and then, you know, the anxiety level will go up in the passengers. Certainly not for me because I know, oh, well, he's doing what you're trained to do from day one, when you start doing your landings, if this landing doesn't feel right, go around. You have fuel. That's what the extra fuel reserve is for. So you go around, you make sure it's an, the best landing you can do because that's more important. The safety of everyone is more important. And and uh, it reminds me of when, um, when since, uh, for example, I, I speak Latin and I, I assume you do as well, at least with your, your students and uh, in those kinds of settings, we know what it feels like to use any given verb and these words that have a highfalutin sound to them may be in English. Well, they don't in Latin. They're, t they're totally, you know, just, just, um, uh, we swest me, he all crackere. Just, you know, that's seemed like the thing to do. You know, we have, and we have visible and all these things and they have a much more real and tangible feel. No doubt authors of English of the past who had a similarly, um, intimate experience with the language felt perfectly free to use those words in English because they were, they were normal to them and to many of their readers. Yeah. 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 Well, so we need to learn Latin. Of course, I already agreed with that, but, but I, 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 I wanted to see if, if we could challenge it a bit. Does that mean we ought to learn, you know, just let, send our kids off to, uh, to take, Oh, they have Latin in your high school. Go, go do that. And then they get there and then they end up just day one, translating some bit of Caesar or, maybe Cicero, if they're lucky. Um, is that is that the way? What is the way? How ought we to be teaching Latin in classes, whether high school or university or any any level? Right. Um, well, the uh, as I mentioned before, I think Roger Ascom was 
perhaps more so than any other uh, individual um, responsible for killing Latin. Um, when was Roger Ascom? I don't care. So he's writing in he's um, writing in the late 16th century, and um, he wrote he wrote a book called The Skullmaster, and it's um it's uh, he he had a lot of influence um uh in in england and how they were teaching but that's when he recommends double translation and he wants to stop people from using the language to communicate and um his reasoning for that was a desire for purity so if you um if you let you, kids use latin it's going to be about three seconds before they start using it improperly. And um, so the problem that he was looking at was, all right, we've got these great authors, which are wonderful sources for pure and good Latin, but schoolboys mess it all up by using Latin in goofy ways um, or ways that seemed right to them um, all day long. And um, as a result, they end up not sounding like good Romans and they don't have good quality Latin. And so what he was trying to do was separate um, uh, an individual student from his peers as an influencer. He didn't want any influences from, from uh, peers and only make the sources um, only make the fontes the the source for um, for someone's Latin, and um, in doing so, um, he uh, he effectively made it a non language, um, and so uh, that was not his intention, uh, um, I'm sure. But his desire for the you know, the, the perfect is the enemy of the good. And I think that that's, that's really where that takes off in the English speaking world. And that opinion persists. Yeah. I've had arguments with people, yeah. polite ones, but arguments with people about that itself. Right. I've heard it called the speaking of Latin in whatever way, whether good or bad, cultural appropriation, a buzzword that, that people use sometimes right perhaps and sometimes wrong um and th to this i to that i responded to the the person this is a professor latin in, in england i said well what if erasmus erasmus wasn't an ancient roman or he wasn't cosplaying I say well erasmus was was different you know why there wasn't a good answer to my my question yeah i think that um I think that if you want to really learn a language, if you really read, if you want to be able to read, you must learn to be able to think in a language. So um, language itself is reflects the structure of the thoughts, the categories of the mind. Um, uh, and if you can't understand those categories and structures for yourself, then it turns the process of reading into an act of decoding. And so uh, now many people through a translation method are smart enough and talented enough and spend enough time that I think they get over this hurdle and they really do um, uh, get to the point where they can think in a language that they've never spoken in and that they've never heard spoken um, but I would argue that this is a tiny, tiny, tiny percent of the population that's capable of doing this. These people are talented enough that they can learn a language with, you know, 75% of their brain, uh, brain tied behind their back. Um, so it's, it's, it doesn't, what an it doesn't image real. There's a nice one. Yeah, sorry. No, I liked yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> so the, um, Basically, the um, people learn language patterns through hearing and through speaking and through reading and writing. And um, when you start reducing how many um, channels 
that uh, you're interacting with that language, you're just making it more difficult um, on the learner. And so um, when you want someone to learn how to really use a, uh, to understand a concept, you can talk about it, but if you just let them use it, it becomes far more natural. So um, where some a grammar translation method would say, okay, let's have, let's teach the perfect passive participle. Okay, perfect passive participle, here's what it looks like in Latin, here's the form. And we translate it, having been blank ed, having been, been blank ed. So whenever you see this form, we need to replace it with having been blank ed. Gosh, I've uh, never even heard that before. I understand what you're saying, but that's... Oh, no, that's absolutely... Um, that, that's that's in Wheelocks. Um, you know, that's... Oh, yeah. I got well, that. There. Um, <laughs> so uh, you forgot. But now that's one way of approaching it. Now, every time you reach one, you translate it into a formula that you understand. Okay. Uh -huh. Now, as opposed to... What I would argue is you're using, I like to call it mixed methodology Latin, MML. Um, it's really the ancient way of teaching language all the way back to the Romans, but, um, you know, it needs a fancy new name to brand it. MML, I like that. It sounds like the ring and the, you know, yeah. going at it. MMA, MML, good. Right. So um, in this method, what you're trying to do is show them how to use it to express thought. So you teach them what it looks like and you show them how it works. And then what you do is you let them come up with examples. You're doing what Roger Ascom would have hated. And so you let them supply and see how many places they can use these in meaningful ways. So they're going around the classroom and they're saying they're using this new form and People are cracking up around the room as, of course, you know, you've got the jokers are coming up with hilarious situations that are meaningful. They actually mean something. Um, and everyone gets it. Everyone understands that. And then somebody comes up with a really sad example and it just all gets quiet as everyone's like, oh, yeah, you had to go there. OK. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is you're actually practicing what you're doing when you read literature you are actually directly experiencing the language used in a meaningful way to communicate between people and so that's that's a big difference between a cipher um uh and decoding you're actually using it well then what do you uh, feel about full immersion um uh your day one could be any language since we're, well, Latin will be the focus could be any French or Spanish or something day one you're just hearing input from the teacher in that language uh what what, what do you feel about that and I want to dissect that a little bit more so um uh total immersion is uh of course wonderfully fan you know effective um this is a great way to learn a language we know that because everybody who knows their first language, that's how they learned it. Um, and we're speaking right now a language that we, we uh, learn by total immersion. And for secondary uh, language learning, that works as well. If you can be immersed in a language, you can learn it fast. It's great. The problem is where people start messing with what the word immersion actually means. Immersion means volume. It means an incredible amount of volume. Um, it means not one teacher teaching 15 students for 30 minutes a day, three times a week. It means being surrounded by people who are fluent in the language and you are hearing it used um, for hours every day. And you have the necessity of being of having to use that language in order to just live your life. Hmm. Um, that's what total immersion means. And so I'm a huge fan of total immersion, but I would say the problem is that it is extremely expensive to produce in ancient languages. Now, conventicula, um, the various sorts of conventicula are a great example of total immersion 
where you've got a whole bunch of teachers uh, who get together and talk in Latin for a week. And that's great. But even that wouldn't work unless everybody pretty much knew a lot of Latin going into it. If everyone went to it and didn't know any Latin and there was just a few guys uh, there who were fluent, they couldn't immerse anyone. It actually requires a lot of people who already know. A critical mass so of some sort. The critical mass. And so the the real issue is um, I don't think total immersion is actually possible to recreate in a modern classroom um, it, because no one can afford to, um, if you did a bilingual school where you had to speak in Latin um, all day long or you know half the day or something like that and all your teachers were fluent, you could you could get close. Even then, you would have a faculty of a handful trying to immerse a whole bunch. You'd have to have a lot of videos and things like that. You could do, you could get there, you know, go in that direction, but no one has that. Um, and so, um, immersion in that sense, in that real sense, I think we just need to be honest um, about the math. We don't have the volume to create total immersion except for kind of after people have learned a certain amount of Latin and then they go to these conventions where they can actually practice with others and get really, really good. Um, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was, uh, want to, uh, to offer any challenges I can think of to that. Um, I'm saying I disagree, disagree, but I think what Bill Van Patten does, he teaches uh, both French and Spanish, as I recall, certainly Spanish. Um, and he's uh, made a podcast. He's, he's, I've listened to the, a lot of these where he's talked about uh, input, comprehensible input, uh, methodology, and second ang language acquisition. So those are so modern languages where where he specializes, and a lot of the ideas uh, of that people have been importing into the classical studies are, are from these modern language things. Are you saying it's equally difficult? Certainly, with say you know whatever three hours three class sessions a week for any given language. All, do you think it's equally unrealistic or not a good way for to teach the language or make acquisition happen of the language for, uh, for students of a uh, French or Spanish? So first of all, I'm not saying that immersion is not, something you should be using it's just not really learning by total immersion that's total is an important word there mm -hmm. so if somebody uh and i do this myself so many of my classes are taught only in latin um and as uh, even with beginning uh latin students we'll pick one day a week in which we're pretty much going to talk in latin as much as we can with the latin that they know and i would say that's absolutely essential for uh, to um, really develop Latin is you need to take a time where you say, we're only going to use this to communicate. And unfortunately, an hour is barely enough time to really make that work. Um, but I still think it's really, really important. And so when you're talking about the comprehensible input and all of that, I think that's that's all real. Um, but the issue is you can't actually use comprehensible input alone in the modern um uh in the confines of a, of a modern classroom simply because there isn't enough time and uh, at least uh, and this my my knowledge is classical languages um you know, with modern languages it's completely possible that um it requires less um but i would would say yes you need to spend time in the classroom where you're using the language and practicing how to use it but it's not going to be enough um, to just do that in a disordered way like total immersion so another major difference is um uh you you um I, i'm a big, big fan of teaching the language in an ordered way where you take a small bit of the language and you learn to use that. And then you have this kind of sphere of fluency and you might know a few forms 
and you're using those in meaningful ways, a few vocabulary words, and then you grow that and add a few more, and then you work on fluency within that, and you kind of grow from there. That's different from total immersion, where it's I'm using the entire language all the time with my students. So a lot of people who would say I use an immersive method would agree with me on that and that they shelter the language early on and then slowly grow it over time. So with Latin, Lingua Latina is the textbook that most of your co comprehensible input immersive method teachers would use. But that textbook is sheltered. It's extremely ordered in how it does so. And I think it's a brilliant order. Um, uh, because it allows you to use the language in meaningful ways to talk about stories and things like that with a small bit of it, and then you grow it over time. Um, and that's, that's what I would define as middle. Um, so true immersion is where you just say, I'm just going to speak in Latin a whole lot, and then they're going to pick it up on it over time. Well, um, yeah, that doesn't sound terribly uh, efficient, but one thing too of, um, of, uh, some things I've, I've heard even conversing with Latin teachers who advocate various comprehensible in input methods. One thing that I was thinking about is how the with that input-based method, the, the student shouldn't be compelled to produce until the student is ready. It's very interesting. And I don't and I I've seen the studies that talk about the effects of filter of course is crash and, and build and Pat and all these these folks talking about these things um comparing to what i like to do for myself when learning or acquiring a language i personally like to produce but i i'm willing to believe that it's best not to necessarily force force the students when they're receiving this input eventually they'll say something when they're when they're ready i i i, I i'm sure you you don't uh you don't 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 agree with that, but I'm wondering if we can somehow test that because the the studies that I'm aware of say that this that is the way way to go at least for modern languages. I don't know. Yeah, I'm I'm not confident that anyone has figured out how to create a study that would actually be reliable for what would happen in a classroom um, in this regard. But um, I think that in general, if you are learning a skill. Um, you need any skill, you need a feedback loop. And so if you're learning to throw a basketball into a hoop, you need to throw a basketball and you see, so number one, you try something, you throw the basketball. Two, you see if it worked. Did it go in the hoop or did it fall to the ground without even touching the rim? Mm. And then you either adjust or confirm whatever it is you just did okay mm -hmm. so those are your three steps in the feedback loop try something evaluate and then adjust or confirm and repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat um the thing i don't like about the um the lack of comprehensible output um is that it doesn't actually encourage you to um you can't have a feedback loop if you're not really putting it out there. And so it's impossible to verify what's really going on in somebody's mind. And I, you know, I speak Latin all the time in front of students and students learn pretty quickly um, how to pretend that they're understanding what you're doing. They do. Some of my, students, some of my students are probably watching this and are going to laugh because yeah, I know what you guys were doing sometimes. <laughs> They'll do this thing where they just um, they know somebody else who does get it starts laughing and they immediately start laughing. Right. Or they're That's trying. The right. And so the, the issue is there's no way to know whether or not they're actually comprehending them, uh, comprehending the text or whatever it is that they're doing if they're not outputting anything. Um, mm. Now. I think the 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 reason why people are looking at, at there's no need for output is they're thinking of little children and how we learn our first language. Mm -hmm. I would say, yeah, the only reason why um, that they didn't output is because they couldn't. Um, and if you were to take total immersion 
and take a six-year-old kid um, and immerse him in, you know, say, uh, you know, he's he's now uh, in a Spanish-speaking country, and he was. How long do you think it would take him to say some Spanish words and try them out with the other kids in the playground? Do you think he'd wait two years? That's because that's baloney. He wouldn't. Um, right, he'd be getting stimuli from the environment, which would induce his response, even if it came out in the wrong language. That's interesting. Which, no, he would actually, he would very quickly. But he would hear others. Use, he other would start kids. using Spanish words. There's, you know. He's trying to live. He's trying right. to function, right? And so, you know, he's, he's trying to man. You know, give me the ball. play soccer with the other kids who are speaking yeah. Spanish, right? And he picks up the ball and, and he's like, what is this? <laughs> like, yeah. And somebody tells him and then he uses that word. That's interesting. Um, so, the um you're gonna use it you're gonna start using it a little bit um so yeah i'm not a fan of of not having um uh them actually put it out there in fact so i'm about it probably is about as coercive of a teacher as you get like i'm all like my whole uh classroom is about how can i get as many people to participate as possible now that said it's more like a soccer practice where it's like everyone's trying stuff and the coach is watching around and fixing things and helping people and suggesting things. But what you're not doing is walking around with a clipboard and being like, Ooh, Ooh, that was ugly. No, you yeah, know, I wouldn't. Where's my red? <laughs> um, so I'm a, I, I'm a big fan of uh, people trying stuff and getting it out there and correction and an environment in which everybody understands that we're trying to use a new language and we're all going to make a ton of mistakes. Mm. Um, but um, I, I think it would be too easy for a teacher who doesn't require output to simply just be a guy who can speak Latin and wants to have an audience that has to listen to him and actually not succeed in doing any teaching mm. because all I have to do is talk a lot. Right. Mm. Right. No yeah. one can tell. No one can know. Well, you know, in two years, maybe somebody will say something. Um, so I'm skeptical of that. And um, that said, of course, there's times when students should spend a lot of time listening um, and listening to people speak. That that's that's great. But I also think there are lots of activities. Or right off the bat, people should be trying to use the language and their mistakes are going to teach the teacher what they don't understand and offer um, a helpful, an opportunity for helpful uh, correction. Oh, you don't understand the difference between nominative and accusative. Let me explain that to you. Um, so if you can't know that they don't understand that, how would that be efficient? So, well, but who knows? Maybe the studies will prove you wrong. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I dare say, Tim, that from my limited experience, most people who are trying to use or successfully using Latin in the classroom aren't doing something like what you're recommending, if not exactly that. There's some level of production. There's some level of, um, of engagement, of interaction. And since input has to be comprehensible, there has to be some, to, some if they're doing, if they're just throwing input, well, it's not comprehensible. The message has to be understood, whatever the form in order to be uh, understood, which is it for me, because I, you know, I, I have, you know, read the number of the, these studies and, you know, Krashen's book and things like that. And I, I it, it's a good framework or even a starting point, but I know myself, I, I don't know, I've been starting to really do more output in ancient Greek lately, and it's helped tremendously. Um, my ability to think in the language, because you, the, the, perp, the point of being able to do all this is so that we can read better. And if we can think in the language, then we're going to reflect the thinking pattern of of the author to some degree, not necessarily with the same, certainly not with the same level of sophistication for me in ancient Greek, but for, uh, but in some way, but being able to, um, it almost reminds me of mirror neurons in a way, though that's a, that's a silly uh, comparison, just a way to be able to, to, to see the, the uh, original and create sort of a, 
um, a facsimile at first in our own minds, which becomes an original of its own. Well, I don't I, think that's silly at all. If I understand you, the um, I actually think one one problem people have with output is they don't understand how to scale it down. And so, what is the easiest form of output? It's repetition. So when a student, when a teacher, you know, holds up exhibit A, whatever it is, um, and says, Eke liber, then everyone else in the classroom should be saying, Eke liber. And if they're not, they're missing an opportunity to actually work through their memory. And, and you know this because you speak Latin. Latin endings live in your mouth. They live in the muscles in your mouth. So the, the longest, most ridiculous endings, um, they're a muscle movement. And if you're not developing muscle memory, then you are um, you are not helping yourself um, learn. It's it's almost like you know when you when you hit a baseball, you're not doing uh, calculus with wind resistance and you know trying to figure out when you're supposed to swing that thing. It's a matter of um you've got muscle memory going and then you've got your eyeballs acclimated to kind of when um when is the right time and when you actually your mind goes swing okay it's all kind of built into the the muscle memory well same thing is true of an ending mm -hmm. so you are speaking um and you know oh i need the you know whatever form you're looking for then it just comes out and you don't have to think about it as much. Um, so anyway, you just repetition is, is the most base level. Um, and if the kids are capable of speaking, which they are, if they're learning Latin, well, then why would you not do that? I, 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 I don't understand that. Hmm. You mentioned uh, exhibit A, you have developed Picta Dict you've been able to pick the dicta this uh, platform to to do exactly that right could you tell us a little bit about the platform sure so um uh when i really got into uh latin pedagogy way back in the day um i had gone through some really bad uh latin experiences and i knew that i wanted to learn how to to do it correctly and i was pointed in the direction of university of kentucky um uh, and uh, the fantastic work that Terence Tunberg and Milena Minkova are doing there. Um, and so I had the privilege of studying there for a couple of years. But I was also, um, someone pointed to uh, me to the work of uh, W.H.D. Rouse um, from the Peirce School in England. And um, I poured through um, Rouse's work when I was first teaching um and uh in my first year of teaching after grad school and i was trying to figure out how to replicate the um the pedagogy um what he does he uses a lot he uses a lot of pictures and i would call them micro context to teach small bits of the language directly so you're learning vocabulary through pictures and you're learning grammar patterns also through illustrations and he himself would use um uh whatever the available projector was at the time um, but he's using illustrations to do this and after a few weeks they would have enough pieces of language that they would throw it throw them into a reading that was at a level that they could handle and they're teaching them to, uh, he's asking questions about the text teaching them to respond and this is this is the mixed methodology is one of the more recent examples of mixed methodology um latin um uh and i imitated what he was doing in the classroom and um after many years um i ended up hiring a student to help me draw illustrations because i couldn't uh do it very well and uh, he actually the first one was was just redrawing everything I drew in class because it was so terrible. And um, anyway, many years later, as um, I I really built all of my work around lingua latina originally, um, uh, I wanted to create 
something that would allow people to use Rouse's pedagogy in a classroom easily. And with the 21st century and the ability to have apps um, that uh, people can project and then exercises that people can do at home, um, that's how Pictodicta was born, was trying to just create um, resources that would allow people to do that. So um, yeah, that's that's kind of the, the history behind it. And what what we're trying to do with Pictodicta is not, if people think, oh, it's technology, it must be tech ed. It's not at all trying to replace the teacher. That can, that can never happen. Um, it's designed to enhance by giving them thousands and thousands of illustrated micro examples in a very, very structured way. Um, and then now you can have, of course, recordings and all this sort of stuff. So that's that's kind of how it started. And then kind of as a as a second part of that is um, and this actually is also imitating Rouse. Rouse understood that you don't teach people languages or teach pe get people to great literature by taking the great literature and taking it down to kids. Instead, you use stuff that is age appropriate and you build them up to the point where they can read great literature. Huh. So we know this when it comes to getting is, people to read Shakespeare. Is that just age appropriate or does that work for adults at a, a simple level of comprehension of language too? Yeah. Is it just and a and theme or about the complexity of the, or the story? No. It's absolutely both. And that's, and that's mm -hmm. what Rouse was doing. But you could see this, like we know this in English, we, we don't at good schools we don't say well we want you to read shakespeare um well by eighth grade so you're in kindergarten so we're going to give you a dumbed down version of shakespeare that's simplified um if you do that what would happen is they'd hate shakespeare before they ever knew who shakespeare was all the greatness is drained out and you're just reading this this dry husk um uh, a version. No. What do, what do they read? They read Dr. Seuss, right? They read The Giving Tree. They read all the, the kid classics, and then they build up over time. Mm -hmm. And um, Rouse understood this with a lot of the writings and things that, uh, that he and his team were creating at the Perth School. And so that's something that we've tried to do, where uh, um, getting um, teachers, successful teachers, and particularly ones with really good senses of humor um, that are a little dark and demented, usually, um, to write these stories that kids actually are interested in reading. And I edit them. Um, and so we have a lot of reading alongside of this. And, and that's where a lot of um, of my work is, is in trying to help produce a literature that good teachers can actually use and engage uh, these, these uh, students with when they're in seventh grade. And um, there's too little literature um, out there for these ages. And people like to look at Lingua Latina. And the truth of the matter is Lingua Latina is, is fantastic. I love it. I've taught it for 20 years, but the, um, it, it doesn't, it progresses too quickly, um, to, uh, to really get at those younger ages. Mm -hmm. So there's only a few chapters that are at a very, very young, an elementary, um, age. I'd say up level. to five and maybe seven and that's where it ends. Exactly. Yeah. You know, <laughs> this is chapter yeah. is the end of it all. Wow. And, um, and then middle school, it extends for a few more chapters. And so when 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 uh, teachers are using these materials, they are using Lingua Latina, they tend to teach very slowly. And mm -hmm. I think what happens is they've actually um, uh, lost the purpose of using it in the first place. It right. was supposed to give them tons of examples, but if you're going through it at a snail's pace, you're not actually getting that volume of examples. Mm. And so like extensive uh, reading, having, um, for example, I've always uh, advocated using at least the Colloquia Personaro and the um, mm -hmm. Fabrai Surai and, and every, every possible supplement that goes along with 
um, that series at every level, like the the four uh, books that one can read, um, that uh, three of which or Orberg did after Familia Romana, before you go into Roma Eterna, and all the, those things too. So an extensive reading, extensive volume. That's that's uh, it's really good advice. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we're we're trying to contribute to the amount of. Um, of age appropriate and complexity uh, um, appropriate readings for beginning students. And um, a lot of the stuff that people write out there is not um, grammatically sheltered. And what we do is very organized like Orberg. We basically follow Orberg's progression um, with a few, a few tweaks, but we're gonna start with nouns and slowly work into verbs. Um, and uh, we, we follow his progression, although we postpone relative pronouns and accusative infinitive, which tend to um, give younger students a lot of heartburn. And That's so, a great place for volume. Lots of relative pronouns and volume until you get it. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I resonate a lot with it. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. I was thinking too about something that we were saying at the beginning of our conversation, which is about English prose from simple, even simple people's letters, uh, one to the other, having the complexity, the syntactic, and in some cases, vocabulary complexity that we might see in Latin, something Ciceronian. I was thinking too about Latin. I mean, Latin, Latin didn't just, Latin isn't like that because it's, it's Latin as a language. It's the literature is like that. Because um, it certainly has a lot of interesting things grammatically that permit certain complexity. But Latin is like that because it was trying to become a literary language. The author is guiding it, like Cicero uh, and among, among others, were, were bringing these things into the language. Horace and Virgil on the poetry side. And they, they uh, Catullus imitating um, the, the one... Um, uh, the one poem by uh, by Sappho. I'm trying to remember that one, and and these sorts sorts of things. So so it, it it's I I bring that up, and and you can feel free to disagree with with, with me if I'm if I'm uh, if I'm if I may be incorrect. But that's I'm feeling like the um, what I, I've read and what I've understood is that Latin authors were trying to imitate the literature that they knew as the high literature, which is Greek. And of course, Greek didn't start that way spontaneously either. They had hundreds of years of listening to Homer, and then they started writing prose and all sorts of other things around the you know the fifth century, a little before maybe, and uh, and and creating all this other stuff. They were trying to create complex thought in the written word, but a language itself, if it's just if we're like his Latin, Latin isn't um, something that's austere or or complicated in of itself, though the literature is written to be powerful in the ideas it can express because those authors were trying, the, the cream of the crop is a literature that survived with a few exceptions like the Hermeneumata, the Interpretamenta that we have that shows something a little bit more, you know, casual. Um, do, do you think uh, my, my notion there is right that the development of Latin into a macro language, into a robust language as English did too is because it was imitating uh, a model that existed uh, before it and, and Greek was able to, they were trying, they were actively trying to, uh, or maybe they weren't, maybe, maybe, maybe the, the Greeks are there, they're special. You know, they were able to just uh, invent uh, all of that, that from, and then everything else has been an imitation from that point. Am I, am I right about that? What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I think that's exactly uh, what happened. I mean, um, Latin itself um, was uh, incapable of doing a lot of the things that the Latin we know um, uh, is capable of doing before the the influx of Greek. So, of course, in their situation, they conquer Greece and then have this super awkward situation where the conquered people are clearly superior in some respects to the conquerors. And um, you can imagine, I mean, you, you see that very clearly um, in their literature. They, they don't like the idea of 
the Greeks um, being superior, um, and uh, they they want to to um, prove that they they can reach those heights. So that does cause them to stretch to grow their language. You know, you have lots of things like Cicero who's taking the philosophical language of the Greeks and is bringing it into Rome, adding new words and new ways of expressing things to popularize Greek philosophy in, um, in uh, Roman, um, in the Roman empire. And um, yeah, so that's a big part, but simultaneously the simple Latin does exist. And that's something that um, we try to do a lot. Uh, a lot of people will criticize, oh, why are you writing baby Latin? Why are you writing um, kid Latin? Which, which we do for the very young levels. Uh, and they'll criticize Lingua Latina for the same thing in chapter three, chapter four. Um, but the reality is that real Romans actually sometimes speak very simply. Um, you know, I've heard people say, how, how, why would you ever simplify a story to the present tense? Like, how could you do that? Um, it, you know, that's, why would you do that? And the answer is, well, one, because it gets people reading really fast um, and enjoying the complexity. Two, um, if you're actually looking at real Roman literature, they do this. Um, they'll just switch into present tense and just talk about stuff and they don't care. And then three, it's not just the obscure guys who do this, you know, uh, poetry, um, actually the, the great, the epic poets stay in the present more often than they stay in the perfect. Um, and so, um, anyway, I, uh, yes, I agree of the, the shift of the language, but the simple aspects of it, I think, um, are still extant and we can use those as examples to kind of create our own literature and create more of the simple stuff so that students can move through the simple literature and grow into the big, the, the, the important stuff, the great literature. Well, why should we care in the example of using English? So we study Latin, we get better at English, we appreciate Jane Austen, all these other authors better. We can write in a way that looks more like those those lovely uh, letters from the Civil War era and other other things. Why should we care? What what does that do for us? Why not just express things simply? Right. Well, I think um, I think uh, if you we're only really capable of thinking in the categories and the thought structures um, of the languages that we know. And I think that you can see that very clearly where um, two cultures collide, where you have two cultures collide and there's multiple languages going on. It's very common to see this explosion of new ideas, of new technology, even um, literature and all of that. And uh, I think that the, when people are confronted with a new way of looking at things, um, they see things in a different perspective because they, they know a different language and they, they know different words. They have different categories and ways of expressing things and therefore thinking about them. They get new ideas. And so I, I would say if you're content to just, um, hey, I just want to say things as simply as possible. I don't want to challenge. I don't want anything different from what I'm doing. I think that um, that um, you're not going to grow um, in many, many ways. Uh, you know, intellectually, culturally, I think that you're you're going to be stunted. Um, mm -hmm. And when you uh, learn other languages um any other languages you are going to see the world in a different way because the language itself is um is a different way of looking at the world and so you learn a foreign language like mandarin you're going to see things a different way you're going to think different things are funny that you were incapable of thinking um before when you do that with ancient languages it also adds the dimension of past to it and an understanding of where we came from Oh, that's why we talk that way. Uh, I've 
I've always believed this and thought this, um, but now I understand how where it came from. But but why grow? What what why care about the past? Saying being stu- being stunned. Oh, you you call me stunt? You know, it's like what like what what's the the purpose of of this this growth you speak of or this thinking in different ways? All right, well I already laugh at stuff. I don't need to laugh at the the same stuff that the Mandarin Chinese speakers do. Where? Well, yeah, tell me what the the value might be in in such a thing. Yeah, I think um, it's it's uh, it's funny because you ask about something so basic and it could be. You know, give you a little pause to. I know. To, well, obviously, I completely yeah. agree, but I, I, I kind of want to drill down on this. Right, what, you want to like, drill down. What? Why, why grow? Well, I think. Yeah, the, why read history too? I mean, there's a lot of th- things we can get into, but when it comes to the growth, seeing things from different perspectives, increasing the complexity of our thoughts. I think it, I, I think we're getting to the we're really getting to the metaphysical here. The um, and you know, ultimately. I believe that this is what it is to be human is um, this is this is humanitas um, mm-hmm. right here, which yeah. is we strive to understand the world around us and to order it and to describe it, to see the beauty in it, to see the goodness in it um, and to articulate that, to see uh, uh, what is beautiful and recreate um, create things that are good, beautiful, um, and true. And, um, I think if you want to go much further than that, I think then we're, gotta, yeah. Yeah. It, we might go, might go too far, but I, I thought I would like to, it's worth us. <laughs> maybe when it's those questions that Plato leaves us with, we're like, he doesn't answer it. Well, Socrates doesn't answer, but what we're supposed to think about it. I can, something that occurred to me is, by increasing the complexity of our thought through more complex, more detailed ways of understanding things, we I think we make ourselves less vulnerable to rhetoric that may be seeking to take advantage of us, or to uh, or even to notice if someone is expressing um, things, expressing ideas in a ways that are inherently simple. And doesn't seem to show even a capacity for for a lot of, like more complex things that that maybe that's reflective on of certain things, especially if someone I don't know, I guess I'm thinking of politicians who just almost universally have tended to make um, everything they say that fit into sound bites and really simple. So they can be especially if it's to an international audience, so it can be translated, you know, they, rather easily. Um, spontaneously they interpret interpreters and things like that and how that that has an uh an effect too whereas if we have you know a capacity to at least write in in english in a more ciceronian jane austen like pattern once in a while maybe not always we can kind of get there maybe that level of sophistication in ourselves can let us kind of go go uh go around them there's uh kind of like being able to be 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 faster like if you're um competing in a dogfight for example there's something that the air force uses called the uh, OODA loop um which is observe orient decide and act where uh the a great example of this is the invention the development of the f-16 which looking at the previous uh fighter was was the f-4 phantom the f-4 phantom was was fast but it was not very maneuverable and thus in uh, in Vietnam, for example, the um, Air Force uh, was hardly able to to work in any dogfights because for a number of reasons, but simply because it could not outmaneuver those aircraft. So something like the F-16 was developed because it could um, give the pilot the opportunity to observe and orient and then make a decision and then act many times faster and keep doing that loop again and again. Mm-hmm. I think that being able to express ourselves with complex thought and of course only to appreciate the complex thoughts written by others is a way to put us ahead and just to boil it down to utilitarianism. Like we're then able to manage life itself better. And that's that's just the thing that occurred to me as you're you're speaking. Yeah, I no, have, there's you know. there's no doubt. Yeah, on on a more pragmatic level, yeah, um, 
this means power. If you can mm -hmm. understand what people are saying and if you can articulate things that are complicated and if you can see the world in a different way, um, then that is going to, that's power in almost any arena of life. Um, now, yeah, so I, I mean, I, that's true. Yeah, yeah, well. Uh, for good or for evil. What's that? <laughs> for good or for evil for good or for evil yeah that yeah that's that's yeah. why we should all you know arm ourselves in with uh with these these capacities well tim thank you so much for the, the conversation that uh, we've had today uh thanks to everybody out there for watching and if you have any uh, questions or comments please leave them below and uh thank you very much thanks tim gracias tibiago Thank you. Gratis, Siviago. Vale. Vale.